Greetings, we are so glad you decided to join us today. Let us go into the sanctuary. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. God bless you. I am so excited to be able to come and join with you on this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I am rejoicing, and you ought to be rejoicing. And yes, we are glad in it. I am so excited and so ecstatic that God has given us yet another day. And we ought to be thankful and grateful for every gracious moment that he bestows upon us. Listen, I need your help. 
I am asking for 500 volunteers to help us reach our young people and make certain that our young people are able to simply read. I need your help. And on tomorrow, I want you to know that there will be a big meeting and you can see the address there below. If you would join us for that meeting on tomorrow for an overview and orientation of what we're going to be doing to work with young people in our school system. You don't have to live in our city. You don't have to be a member of our church to participate, but we need your volunteerism to help us to save a generation. As a matter of fact, I want to talk about that in just a few moments. Come go with me for a few moments and I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Bible here in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, right there, the sixth verse. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by putting on of my hands. I want to talk about, I have a gift for you, or rather should I talk about, gifted for something. That's what I want to talk about. Gifted for something. There is a gift inside of you and God has gifted you for something. I want to tell you, beloved, that I don't ever want you to debate about what your purpose is. I have said this before and I'll say it again, that there are two factors that will simply produce your purpose. One is pain and the other is passion. And the question that you must raise is this, what is it that your pain is pushing you to? Many of us have gone through some painful things in our life and that we have experienced some things that some of it we can talk about and some of it we cannot. What is your pain pushing you to? And then the question I want to ask you is, what is your passion pulling you from? What are you so passionate about that you would do it whether you get paid for it or not? Whether they call your name for it or not, what is your passion pulling you to? And as you begin to understand the role of pain and passion, therein is produced the manifestation of your purpose. It's in your purpose that your gift becomes realized. There's a gift inside of you. Can I tell you, that the Bible has made it very clear that the gifts that come from God or without repentance. That means that God is not going to give you something and then turn around and take it back. There are times when people may act funny with you and people may act strange and sometimes bless you with something and then desire to take it back. There are times when people may bless you with favor and bless you with a compliment and then turn around and take it back. That's not how God treats gifts. God gives us gifts and the gifts are without repentance, which means that once God has gifted you with something, that his grace and his sovereignty is such that God will not take it back but there is something that you must do to manifest the gift that is within you. And here in this text, it says that you must stir up the gift that is within you. I love this passage of scripture because in this passage of scripture, Paul here has come to the end of his journey. Paul has already experienced the time where he has had a thorn in his flesh. You remember when Paul dealt with that thorn, and, and I'm so glad that Paul did not name that thorn because he leaves it in a general way to 
remind us that all of us have a thorn that we have to deal with. A thorn could be a coworker that you're working with. A, corn, a thorn could be a neighbor that is getting on your last nerve. A, a thorn may be uh, someone that, that does not necessarily see things like you see them, but, but they're agitating you and aggravating you. It might be someone in the relationship with you. It could be a thorn. He doesn't say what the thorn is. Some thought it was epilepsy. Some thought it was malaria that he was dealing with. Some thought it was an optical condition. Paul does not say what the thorn was. He said, I had a thorn that was stabbing me. It was jeering me. And he says, I prayed against the thorn three times for God to remove it. And God did not remove that thorn. But Paul says that after I prayed against that thorn, the word came back and said, Paul, don't worry about the thorn for my grace is sufficient for thee. I wish that someone this morning would just put in the chat box and tell somebody that the only reason that I have survived my thorn is because of God's grace. It's not because I have been so perfect and so good, but his grace has sustained me. Paul has already come through the thorn. He's already come through the whipping of 39 times on his back. You remember when after he healed that man down there in Lystra and the Bible says that they came and they wanted to kill Paul for healing and delivering and they drug him outside the city and they left him there half dead. I love that. I love that because the Bible declares they left him outside the city half dead after beating him for 39 times. But I hang on to the words half dead because if Paul was half dead, that means that he was still half alive. And if he was still half alive, that's all he needed to get back into the city to let those who tried to kill him know that you can kill what God wants alive. Would you please put that in the chat box and tell somebody that you can kill what God wants alive. I, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but there is an enemy that's on your trail. There is something that's been chasing you. There is a past that's been after you. There is something that's been haunting you in your past, in your mind, in your memory, and it's been trying to kill the dream, kill the vision that's on the inside of you. But can I tell you, sometimes you got to speak to your own mind and tell your own mind that you shall come forth and the enemy can kill what God wants alive. I, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but there comes a time when you got to speak life over your children, speak life over your house. I'll speak life over your parents and you got to remind the enemy that he can't kill what God wants alive. So Paul crawls back into the city as if to tell them that you don't decide where my destiny ends. I decide with God where my destiny ends. So then he's already come through that. He's already preached to the uh, Anthenians, and he's already preached to Agrippa, preached with such profundity and with such oration that even Agrippa said, leave this man alone, for he has almost persuaded me to become a Christian. He has come to all of that, and now he has come to a place where he realized that he must pass the torch. So he calls Timothy, come in here, Timothy. I want you to know that there is something inside of you that I am giving you the charge to stir it up and to continue this work. I know that is within you because it was in your mother and your grandmother. I want you to know that Paul is talking to Th Timothy for two reasons. I'm almost done. First, he has 
succession on his mind. And then he has legacy on his mind. Succession, legacy, both may go hand in hand, but there is a slight difference. Succession is who I'm leaving behind. Legacy is, is what I'm leaving behind. And so then now, he says, I want you, Timothy, to take what I have been doing, pick it up and continue it. Understand this, that there comes a time when you got to start thinking about succession. That the mark of a mature Christian is not what is in it for you, but what's in it for those coming behind you. I am so thankful that I have many who have paved the way for me, my generation, and they left something behind. Can I tell you that we are in a crisis today because it seems that our generation has prospered, we have profited, we have done well for ourselves in many ways, and now we must raise the question, what are we leaving behind? What is this whole idea of our young people not being able to read today. How do we get to a place where we are in fraternities and sororities and we are owning uh, production movie companies and we are on Wall Street and, and we are in corporate buildings and corporate plazas. We are living in homes. We're doing better than we ever have, but we have a generation that cannot read. I was blown away when I met with a team of principals and they told me that there were children on their way to third grade and we're not reading at grade level proficiency. Don't you know that from grades one through three, a child learns to read? But from grade three to 12, a child reads to learn. How do you learn if you can't read? And the result of this is that we're profiting in the world, but we're losing our soul. We're losing our soul when our children don't know their alphabet and don't know their vowels and don't know their consonants and cannot write a complete sentence. We're losing our soul when they cannot pronounce words and put phonics together. We're losing our souls. And, and then when we turn around, we look and many of our churches are silent. And we're losing a whole generation. Paul calls on Timothy because succession is on his mind. And the question I raise to you today is what are you leaving behind? I'm not talking about your house. Maybe your house is in order. Maybe your children are doing well. Maybe they are attending North Carolina A&T, Winston-Salem State University, Shaw, Livingstone, Howard, Morehouse. Maybe they are attending Elon Duke or wherever they may be going. Maybe they are doing well, but what about us as a whole? What are we leaving behind? Paul says, come here, Timothy. I want to leave this work in your hand. Do we have a work that we're leaving in the hands of the next generation? Then he has legacy on his mind. He says, I know that there's something in you because it was in your mother and your grandmother. Can I tell you that we have been blessed with a rich legacy? 
We come from kings and queens. We are the inventors of mathematics and science. And we, when you look at the history of the African people, we are inventors. We are those who are the original uh, makers of many things that we benefit from today. When you look at the pyramids, somebody had to put those together. We come from people of great minds. How do we get to a place where we can't read? And we can't write. Talked to one principal, and she told me that out of 36 children in her class, in her school, in one class, that zero of them could perform at proficiency level. In another school, out of 126 children in one grade, only 12 were able to proficiently perform. And our churches are silent. What I'm trying to tell you is that we need help. And it's time for those of us who have been gifted, who have something on the inside of us, who are lawyers and doctors and school teachers and pastors and business persons and custodians and secretaries and teachers. It's time for us to rise up and stir up the gift that's in our children because God has gifted them. They just have to be reminded that they must stir it up. There's a gift inside of them. And it's our job to help them to stir it up. There's a gift inside of you. And there's a gift inside of them that God has blessed us all with. I already told you that the gifts are without repentance. God is not taking it back. So if we don't help them to discover the gift, it goes for naught. It's just a gift that's there. What I'm trying to tell you as I move to my close, Paul says to Timothy, stir it up. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Our young people are walking around fearful today because many in their culture are shooting up each other and killing one another. We have guns that are being confiscated from schools every week. And our children have to learn in fear. They are going to school in a culture where they have to hear about their friends getting COVID and their friends' parents dying of COVID. They are traumatized. And somewhere in the midst of all of that, God is calling us, those of us who have sustained, who have come through it, who have arrived to help them to understand that God has not given them the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Even in the midst of shootings in our school, we can help empower them to change the atmosphere because it starts with them. Do you not know it was young people their age that turned this nation upside down? That's how it got the civil rights movement going. And then we just recently saw with the Black Lives Matter movement, it was young people turning this nation upside down. And that's where it has to be. They just need a little focus. They just need a little direction. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And as I come to my close, Paul tells him, stir it up. I remember some years ago, I had some Kool-Aid that I was fixing in the kitchen. And I remember very specifically that it was the red Kool-Aid. We didn't call Kool-Aid by its flavor. We called it by its color. 
and I was in there and I was fixing that Kool-Aid and my father walked in the room and I tasted the Kool-Aid after fixing it and it was just as sour as it could be. And I said, my, this Kool-Aid is sour. I don't know why it's sour. And I looked at the bottom and it had sugar all in it, but still sour. And my father saw me and he said, boy, what are you doing? I said, I'm fixing me some red Kool-Aid. I said, but it's still sour. And don't you know, he said, son, the problem is you got sugar in it, but you got to stir it up. And don't you know, when I stirred up the sugar, the sweetness came to the top and I was able to taste the sweetness of the content because I stirred it up. Can I tell you, there's something on the inside of you. There's a preacher on the inside of you. There's a singer on the inside of you. There's a missionary on the inside of you. There's a server on the inside of you. There is a gift on the inside of you, but you got to stir it up. There's a lawyer on the inside of you. There's a doctor on the inside of you. There's a teacher on the inside of you. There is an astronaut on the inside, but you got to stir it up. Stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. Beloved, listen, I am done. I want you to join me. We need 500 volunteers. You see that flyer right there? We need 500 volunteers. We got to save our children. We shall not lose them to the streets. We shall not lose them by gunfire, by stabbings. All they need is a mentor like you, someone to spend one day a week, one hour a week, one day a week, speaking into their life, encouraging them to know that there's a gift inside of them. God bless you, and thank you for joining today. Would you consider sharing a gift with this ministry? If we have been a blessing to you, I want you to sow a gift into this ministry that we may be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Don't forget now, don't forget to sow your tithe, sow your gift, sow your offering, that we may continue this work. I want to announce that if you're watching this on the first airing, that on tonight at 8 o'clock, you can catch the broadcast of Mother Max's book on TCT. And uh, you can go to our website and get the exact address and time for you to tune in for that. That's going to be shown worldwide. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise. They're doing a feature on her book before you go to the hospital. And God has done a tremendous thing. I'll be doing the interview for that. And uh, thank you all for praying for her. And let's thank God for the promotion of that book. God did that. And uh, she got a call to do something with that book from TCT. And we're so thankful uh, for Santosh and for those who work with that whole program. Thank you for uh, supporting that. Don't forget, that's tonight. Go to our website and you'll see more information about that. God bless you. And thank you for joining us on this day. God bless you. First of all, we want to thank you so much for your generous support so that we can continue to operate in excellence. The following are ways to give tithes and offerings using technology. Use the Push Pay app or go to giving page on the Union Baptist website. Use the Cash app, which is dollar sign UBC 1200 trade. Use the Givelify app. Union Baptist Church, Winston-Salem. For Rise Up Giving, please use the designated cash app. Dollar sign, Union Baptist, Rise Up. If you don't use technology for giving, you may bring your tithes, offering, and Rise Up campaign payments on Sundays from 10 a.m. till noon. Envelopes will be available, or you can mail checks only. No cash, only checks to 1200 North Trade Street, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 27101. 
Download Monday Morning MP3 Mana for an inspirational message. It can be accessed on our website, YouTube, and Facebook. Attend the Zoom Church this week. The daily schedule is listed on the website. To our virtual church, if you need prayer or would like to join the church, please visit the Connect page on our website. We are pleased to introduce MindSight Counseling Services. Please call the church office at 336-724-9305 to schedule an appointment. To those of you celebrating a birthday this week, we pray that you will have a blessed birthday. Day. Remember to protect yourself and stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask, get tested, and stay safe.